Hello. Good evening, everyone. I'm uh, Daniel Chua. I'm head of the School of Humanities and director of the Faith and Global Engagement Initiative. Um, welcome. Well, uh, this is a very exciting event for me because actually this is the uh, second of uh, three events that we're holding to mark a new uh, collaboration, a venture with the Marketplace Institute at Regent College, Vancouver. And so before we even start going any further, I'd like to uh, us to welcome the team from Regent College. We have four people here. We have Paul Williams, Mark Mayhew, John Stackhouse, and also the president of Regent College, uh, Rod Wilson. So let's give them a very warm welcome. Thank you for coming all the way from Vancouver. Now, the Faith and Global Engagement Initiative was launched in June uh, with a lecture by Tony Blair on faith and globalization. And in that lecture, he argued that contrary to popular belief, religion is not going away. In fact, it's coming back. And it's not going private, it's going public. And the 21st century conflicts are no longer about the old political ideologies, but are mostly faith-driven. Yet, globalization means that we have to live with each other in very close proximity, and unless the different faiths learn to engage with each other and with the secular world, we are heading down a very dangerous path. So the question now is this. How should religion engage in the world? How should Christianity engage with the world? Often, when religions go public in a secular world, it can be very contentious, it can be very embarrassing, and it can do more harm than good. And often, the secular world wants nothing to do with it. And yet, not to engage is not an option in the 21st century. So to explore these issues, I'm delighted to welcome the director of the Marketplace Institute, at Regent and the David J. Brown Family Chair of Marketplace Theology and Leadership at Regent College, Professor Paul Williams. Paul is uh, both an economist and a theologian, so he should know how the world works and also how God works, hopefully. Um, he's also um, a person who has, has been in the real world, not just an academic. Uh, he is a former chief economist for DTZ Holdings, uh, and actually he was a consultant uh, on uh, sort of, uh, sustainability and globalization issues uh, for uh, many government bodies. And he's also, of course, a professor at Regent College. So I think he's ideally suited to answer these questions on faith and the secular world. So Paul will speak for about 45 minutes, and then I've asked my co colleague, Benny Tai, uh, to respond a little bit and then to uh, uh, have a time of Q&A for about 20 minutes. So let's begin. When Christianity goes public. Credible? Incredible? Incredulous? Let's find out. Please welcome Professor Paul Williams. Well, thank you very much, uh, Daniel, and to the Faith and Global Engagement Initiative here at Hong Kong University. Uh, I'm very grateful to be here, and on behalf of uh, those of my colleagues at Regent College, we really appreciate the opportunity to partner with you, Daniel, in this initiative, and to be here over this weekend. So thank you very much. It's, it's, it's a real honor to be here with you. Now, my topic for this evening is the role of faith in public life. And although I'm going to make some remarks about the nature and function of the state, my primary focus is the nature of public discourse. One of the points that I shall make along the way is that in a healthy society, the public realm in which all citizens can speak to one another should be a much larger arena than simply the state. Nevertheless, the state has an important role to play in setting the tone for public debate by virtue of its legislative and judicial functions. So in a multicultural society, should Muslims be free to speak publicly about their faith and how it relates to various matters of public policy? If they do so speak, should those of us who are not Muslims regard that 
as a violation of the valid rules of public discourse, perhaps as a threat to the civic order, a neutral matter that maybe is interesting, perhaps irritating, but generally benign, or a positive thing that contributes something to the common good. My argument in this lecture is that, for the most part, the free expression of religious faith in public is a good thing and contributes to the common good. Now, though I am a Christian, arguing for this position based on explicitly Christian theological grounds, I consider my argument to be relevant for Muslims, Buddhists, humanists, whatever other religious viewpoints there may be in any given society. Indeed, I hope that this lecture can serve as an example of a, an explicitly religious contribution to public discourse that's exactly that, a public discourse. So the position I will adopt has been called Christian secularism, perhaps more helpfully, religious pluralism. And it contends that there are some major problems in the operation of secularism in most modern secular states and proposes specific changes to address these problems. Modern secularism has its roots in Christian theology. You might think I'm bound to say something like that, but that's the conclusion of atheists such as the American Austin Klein and Britain Julian Beghini. Devoted Christians, writes Klein, aghast at the devastation caused by the religious wars that swept Europe in the wake of the Reformation, sought common ground to avoid civil war. Drawing on the work of the early church theologian Augustine, these secularizing Christians insisted on a form of church-state separation that required the state to act neutrally or tolerantly with respect to different expressions of faith. Faith could be expressed in public freely, but no particular group should receive state-sponsored advantage. The United States is perhaps the exemplar state in this regard, being one in which the separation of church and state was understood not as an attempt to protect the state from church influence, but rather as the attempt to protect the whole religious community from the influence of a state dominated by one particular faction of sectarian interest. Now, initially, in most of these experiments, the range of faiths in society was relatively limited, typically dominated by a range of Christian denominations. But over time, and especially as a result of globalization, widespread migration, a broader range of religious and irreligious positions gained expression in many Western societies. In Europe and North America, Christians, Jews, and atheists were joined by Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, Sikhs, and others. And these Western models of secularism were exported during the colonial period to states like India, that already had a highly plural religious culture. In Hong Kong today, uh, I'm led to believe that around 45% of the population claim to have no religious affiliation at all. 21% are Buddhists. 14% identify themselves as Taoists. 12% Christian, 3% Muslim, and smaller percentages as Hindu, Sikh, and followers of other faiths. During the late 18th and 19th centuries, a further development took place. Under the influence of en Enlightenment philosophs such as Voltaire, Rousseau, and in the context of increasing religious diversity, the idea developed of a neutral public language as the preferred medium to express public arguments about public policy. Through the 20th century, this grew into the now familiar idea that the public square should remain a place of neutral discourse in which the only kind of arguments and reasons that may be presented are those based on the explanatory model of science. Beliefs and values 
are not to be brought into the public square on this argument. These are to remain where they belong in the private arena. If we're going to resolve matters of public policy, we should only deal with the realm of facts that can be established through the empirical and rational methods of science and are thus in principle accessible to all. I want to come back to this particular notion of a neutral scientific language because I believe it's a mistaken way to frame discourse in the public square. But first we need to note that at the same time as politically secular societies were becoming increasingly multicultural and religiously plural, another process was taking place, namely that of secularization. Secularization involves declining levels of religiosity, the declining influence of religious institutions and practices, and the growth of irreligion. Theorists such as Max Weber, Emile Durkheim, expected secularization to result from modernization and progress. The success of science, the growth of rationality, so the argument went, would push irrational religious belief out of society. And for a while it seemed that everything was going according to plan from the perspective of the atheist enthusiasts of this secularization process. Formal measures of religiosity, such as church attendance, declined steadily in most secular states. But then, toward the end of the 20th century, something became apparent that was completely unexpected. Religion and belief came back, revived. This was the message that Daniels explained Tony Blair brought at the initial event uh, of this initiative. The atheist philosopher Julian Beghini captures well the sense of shock at this realization. When God woke up, he writes, it was as shocking as hearing a knocking on a coffin lid at a funeral. Rather dramatic language. Lois Lee, a sociologist at Cambridge University, writes the following in the UK's Guardian newspaper. While religious experience and practice seemed to be declining in many parts of the world, the atheist vision was untroubled. Today, however, it's become commonplace to recognize the vitality of some forms of religion. And what's more, it's vitality in precisely those democratic contexts that it was once considered to be anathema to. The impact of this shift, she writes, is hard to overstate. It amounts to a dethroning of one of the longest held and deepest seated aspects of modern understandings and identities. It's led to one of the most profound shifts in general and academic thought about what modernity means, how it can be conducted most progressively. Peter Berger, as um, a renowned secularization theorist and sociologist, and in the introduction to his edited book, The Desecularization of the World, Resurgent Religion and World Politics, he provides examples of the kind of unlikely religious vitality spoken of by Lois Lee, ranging from the resurgence of conservative Catholicism and evangelical Protestantism in the West, the rise of global Pentecostalism, the remarkable revival of the Orthodox Church in Russia, the rapid growth of the Orthodox and conservative elements in Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, and Buddhism. Commenting on the necessity of revising his earlier theories as one of the leading proponents of the secularization theory, Berger makes three very important observations. Kind of a confession, how, how I got it wrong. First thing he said, says is that the secularization of religious institutions is not the same as the secularization of individuals. Whilst the role and public support for religious institutions has declined, religiosity and belief are as vibrant as ever. Secondly, Berger argues that modernization in a host of ways has provoked a counter-secularization movement. 
And then thirdly, he argues that the secularization theory would lead one to expect that the most successful religious groups would be those that adapted as fully as possible to the rational and secular norms of modernity. But in fact, it's precisely those more adapted groups, like liberal mainline Protestant denominations, which have suffered the most. And conversely, it's the more conservative and orthodox strands of religion that have flourished. Berger summarizes these developments, the force of them, in this way. Taken together, they provide a massive falsification of the idea that modernization and secularization are cognate phenomena. Let me recap then. So far, I've suggested that firstly, secularism is the idea that church and state, or more generally, religious institutions in the state, should be separated such that the state maintains a public space where a plurality of religious and irreligious expressions can flourish. Second, secularism is not the same as atheism. Secularism has deep roots in Christian theology, though it's also clearly been influenced by other traditions, including an atheistic form of Renaissance humanism. Third, secularism developed, especially in the 20th century, the idea of a public language of facts that relegated belief and values to the private sphere. And fourth, secularism does not necessarily lead to secularization, though it will likely lead to a diminishing direct influence of religious institutions on political processes in those countries where those religious institutions had previously had a significant role in government. I'm thinking here of uh, established church state societies. So this brief sketch that I've begun with of the origins, nature, and development of modern secularism raises, I suggest, three important questions for us to consider in the remainder of this lecture. How do we understand the recent resurgence of religion? Second, how should we speak to one another in the public square? And then third, should Christians support secularism? And if so, how? So these are the questions that I want to focus on for the remainder of my time. What then do we make of this modern resurgence of religious vitality? Well, for many atheist secularists, it's very bad news, has given rise in turn to a resurgence of theophobia. Not only atheists, but agnostics and many religious believers fear those religious groups who they consider want to take control of the political process and impose their religious views on the rest of the population. This kind of fear is fueled by religious extremism and religiously motivated terrorism. It's also rooted more deeply in the history of the 20th century. The era of total war, in which totalitarian regimes committed unspeakable atrocities in the name of fascist and communist ideologies, led to a deep-seated fear of such universal ideologies. Modernity had failed to find a common morality founded on reason. So any claim to truth in the realm of morality was increasingly met with suspicion. All it could be was a masked attempt at asserting power over others. The growing pluralism and diversity of modern societies only increased the desire of many that the state impose some uniformity, some order. And the primary basis for this order was to exclude from political discourse as a matter of principle any claim to truth in the moral realm. This, of course, included religious belief. So the response of many atheists and agnostics to the resurgence of religion is to press ever harder for the complete exclusion of religion from public life. 
For many religious believers, however, things look and feel somewhat different. Part of the reason for the resurgence in religious belief, I suggest, is that modernity has failed to address some of the crucial aspects of human nature. By increasingly excluding the moral, the spiritual dimensions of life from the main public conversations in society and from the dominant institutions of culture, modern life has become increasingly narrow, fragmented, inhuman. Yet when believers attempt to speak of such matters, they frequently hear comments like these. Richard Dawkins, again, writing, uh, you knew that I was going to quote Richard Dawkins at some point, Richard Dawkins writing in uh, September 2001, quote, to fill a world with religion or religions of the Abrahamic kind is like littering the streets with loaded guns. Don't be surprised if they're used. Or this is A.C. Grayling writing around the same time. All religions are such that if they're pushed to their logical conclusions or if their founding literatures and early traditions are accepted liter literally, they will take the form of their respective fundamentalisms. Jehovah's Witnesses and the Taliban are not aberrations but unadulterated, unconstrained expressions of their respective faiths. So this kind of language from prominent atheists like Dawkins and Grayling is heard by religious believers in a number of contexts. One is the persecution undertaken by the avowedly atheistic regimes of Soviet Russia and communist China with their careless disregard for human rights. Another context is the context of the supposedly neutral public square, which seems to get ever larger, constantly encroaching on more areas of life, previously deemed to be part of the private arena in which morality, religion, could in fact flourish. That private arena seems to be getting smaller and smaller. Legislation is used to open up more and more of life to the logic of the market, the logic of individual choice a process that automatically undermines any substantive moral value in familial or communal forms of life. Legislation's also been used to actively discriminate against religious expressions in public. Here's an example. A violation of secularity, the ban on wearing any obvious sign of religious affiliation in the French school system, a law that uh, critics uh, and proponents really uh, alike agree is mainly aimed at the wearing of headscarves by Muslim schoolgirls. So given these experiences and perspectives, religious believers have in part been awakened by an aggressively atheistic form of secularism to become more actively involved in public action in order to protect what they deem absolutely vital to their understanding of human flourishing. Well, we, we have here what is potentially a recipe for increased societal conflict. Atheists leading the way in clamping down on religion because of their theophobia. Believers, on the other hand, insisting on giving full voice to their views in protection of their most deeply cherished values against a new atheocracy. So if secularism is supposed to ensure harmony amongst a plural and diverse society, it's manifestly failing. In addition to these observations about the response of atheists and believers to the renewed vitality of faith, we can make one further point. Perhaps the reason why belief is resurgent in the modern world despite the many scientific and technical advances of the 20th century, the huge increase in education, health, and living standards throughout much of the world, perhaps the reason is this. Belief is part of the human condition. It's an irreducible aspect of human nature. We necessarily want to ask and answer questions of ultimate meaning. Why are we here? What is the world for? What's the purpose of our life? Is there a God? And if so, 
what sort of God uh, is there? What would it look like if we sought to understand one another's beliefs instead of excluding and dismissing them? What does Christianity, for example, actually teach about the human condition and human flourishing? Does it have anything to offer this discussion about the difficulties of an increasingly divisive and conflicted public square? Well, I think it does, and I shall uh, aim to persuade you of that. Since I'm a Christian, I'm going to spend a few minutes explaining that to you. I also know that Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam have contributions also to make. I sincerely hope that they are made, but I leave it to Buddhists, Hindus and Muslims to make them. The Christian account of the world then begins with an understanding of God as a complex unity, a loving communion of persons who can be distinguished but not separated. The space-time universe that we inhabit is understood as the creation of this God through an act of love, a desire to share communion with his creatures and especially with humanity. Creation is understood as having a definite beginning, as being finite in size and as being good. The relationship of all created things, including human beings, to God and to each other can be thought of through the metaphor of a dance. In creation, God extended the loving, joyful dance of his own nature to include all the creatures he had made. Creation is supposed to be a huge cosmic harmony. Humanity has a special place on the earth in that dance. To lead the part of the dance on the earth by loving one another and caring for this planet. Humanity has a special place in creation because unlike other earthly creatures, human beings are created in the image of God. We're his children. Like God, we are persons capable of giving and receiving love, capable of choosing to withhold or reject that love. Evil is understood to arise not from some equal and opposite devil balancing God's goodness in a kind of Star Wars universe of light and dark. No, evil is understood to come into the universe through God's creatures. In other words, evil is not something that exists in itself, but is a distortion of something good. Human beings chose to reject relationship with God in favor of living autonomously without God. God allows this because he wants a voluntary loving relationship with us, not a relationship that is coerced. Because human beings have been given authority by God to lead the earthly dance, then the whole earth is also impacted by this human rejection of God. The Christian story continues to draw us back to himself. God works in human history through one particular family and one nation, Israel, to reveal his nature to us, to teach us how to live. But in the end, all the evil that we've brought into the world and keep bringing into it has to be dealt with. And God deals with it by coming himself as Jesus of Nazareth to absorb all the evil that we've done into himself through his death on a Roman cross, by giving us the perfect example of how to live a truly human life, through his bodily resurrection from the dead, giving us hope that evil, suffering, death, will not have the final say. The Christian hope, then, our orientation toward the future is for something the Bible calls shalom. It's a Hebrew word that means relational peace, harmony, wholeness, flourishing, life. It's a vision that's captured in Jesus' words to us, I have come to give you abundant life. This abundance of life is most fully found by having a restored relationship with God through Jesus, and then a restored relationship with ourselves, with other human beings, 
with creation itself so that we care for it and cultivate it rather than exploiting it or being alienated from it. It's through Jesus that Christians understand our differences to be overcome. The Apostle Paul puts it like this. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. In other words, the identities that divide us are relativized by recognizing our common humanity. All have failed. Jesus died for all of us. All have been offered forgiveness. Christianity does not teach Christians to expect that we will achieve the fullness of abundant life during our earthly life. Indeed, that would be a dangerous utopianism. It will take Jesus' return to put things completely right. In anticipation of this, we are, however, encouraged to work for more shalom, more abundance, more wholeness, more life, in cooperation with God within the limits of our own finitude and moral failure. And this is the focus of Christian mission in the world to work for the reconciliation of all things so that all are better able to achieve their purpose, better able to be in harmony with God, themselves and others, and to experience abundant life. So this understanding of Christian mission is captured well in the words, again, of the Apostle Paul, this time in his letter to the church in Corinth. We try to persuade others for the love of Christ compels us. In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting people's sins against them. And he has given us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. And we plead with you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. So, when Christians engage in public life, this is what their faith teaches them, I suggest. First, to try and serve the common good of humanity by increasing shalom, by helping all parts of humanity and creation to flourish. Second, to try and persuade others of this vision, but not to violate the God-given freedom of all human beings to choose their own way, because this is how God treats us. And thirdly, to serve Christ by serving the weak and the vulnerable. Christians are particularly instructed to protect those who cannot protect themselves. That's why Christians have got involved in anti-slavery campaigns, dealing with the indebtedness of developing countries, opposing sex trafficking and the like. So how does this Christian perspective help us make sense of what's going on in 21st century modern life. Well, one perspective on the problem we face in modern society that it draws our attention to is that without things rightly ordered to God, each part of society, including individuals and institutions, which are good in themselves, tend towards autonomy with respect to other parts. Think about the metaphor of the dance that I've already mentioned. It's as if everyone starts to dance to a different rhythm and a different tune. The harmony of the dance is lost. Conflict increases. In our society, the conflict is understood mainly in the language of rights. The courts are full of essentially irreconcilable assertions of rights of individuals against each other, against institutions, and of institutions against other institutions. It seems that we always find there are more rights being claimed, and then more complaints that these rights have not been recognized. I wonder if that's something you experience at all in Hong Kong. Yet many of the rights we have granted are incoherent, cannot be reconciled with other competing rights. With individuals and each of the spheres of society, I'm thinking of, say, the sphere of business or education or law, 
all of these spheres, individuals as well, all dancing to their own tune, there's no coherent story, there's no moral vision which can bring coherence to these multiple rights, multiple claims. So the result is that we degenerate into making simple assertions of power to get our own way. We shout rather than dialogue or argue. Increasingly, we're unable to argue very well in public because argument assumes the possibility that there's some kind of shared framework of meaning within which I might be shown to be wrong, that I might be able to persuade you of my position. And so because that shared story of meaning is increasingly receding, we simply shout louder. And this magnifies the fear that any claim to truth, such as those made by monotheistic religions, but also made by science, by capitalism, any claim to truth is necessarily an assertion of power over us. So our trust in these institutions, the institutions of church, the institutions of state, the institutions of science and of business, decreases and decreases and decreases. We become more and more suspicious and less and less able to trust any kind of constructive engagement in public. So in this way, our insistence on autonomy, first of all, alienates us from others, then increases our fear of others, and finally makes us unable even to speak to others. Well, I hope you didn't come expecting to be cheered up this evening. Um, this rather depressing point brings us to our second major question. If this is so, how should we speak to one another in the public square? And my very simple answer is that we should speak to one another as human beings. Let me try and explain what I mean. The institution that has most successfully navigated this landscape that I've been describing of pluralism, diversity, and competing rights, the institutions that's most successfully navigated that landscape is the state. Two world wars in the 20th century hugely expanded the power, machinery, and bureaucracy of the modern state. The state apparatus of total war was never completely dismantled. The main intellectual response to the growing fragmentation of society in its ever-increasing diversity has, to been, has been to support a new state or civic religion. This was the explicit goal of the Enlightenment thinkers who proposed the dual nature of public reason, based on facts, and private reason, based on values. They saw this dual language as a way of indoctrinating the population into a new political religion that would bring unity and order in the context of religious diversity. And I suggest to you that the modern state is the realization of that goal, the all-powerful Leviathan of Thomas Hobbes' vision. Effectively, the modern state has been colonized by a powerful ideology that combines a paternalistic utilitarianism with a dehumanizing notion of individual autonomy. And the result is that the state has co-opted and distorted a range of belief systems, including science, atheist humanism, socialism, and capitalism, and, for example, those parts of the Christian religious right too closely allied to capitalism, to name just a few. The state has thereby successfully dominated all of the mediating institutions in civil society between itself and the individual, and now threatens the individual person themselves. Increasingly, individuals find every aspect of her life defined only in terms of individual choice and individual rights. But a life so defined is no longer related properly to others. It cannot experience a sense of belonging in community based on 
who he or she actually is as a person, but only by virtue of the shared tribal interests that the group promotes. The maintenance of this distorted state power relies, I suggest, on the exclusion of moral discourse from public life. Because any real attempt by citizens to consider in what lies their common interest will necessarily relativize the power of the state. So whilst the illusion of moral neutrality is maintained, state power can be exercised on the basis of the technocratic expertise of the elites who control the levers of power. So there's an important connection between the nature of public discourse on the one hand and the limits of state power on the other. If public discourse is truncated and controlled, as I believe it is under the current functioning of secularism, then the state will end up serving the sectarian interests of those who control public discourse. And that will mean that secularism itself will fail because the state will no longer be even-handed toward all religions and worldviews. So when we examine the tightly controlled public language of modern secularism, we find that moral neutrality is a myth. The fact-value distinction on which it rests is false. There is no such thing as a morally neutral public space in the sense espoused by some modern secularists. Facts are always value or theory laden. The political is always and everywhere the domain of morality and ethics. I suggest that there is a giant category mistake present in modern thought that both feeds and undergirds this myth of a morally neutral public space. And it's the idea that the methods of empirical science, which so effectively help us understand the workings of the material world, can be turned round and applied to understanding the human beings who invented those methods. Whereas the material world is what it is, regardless of our study of it, the human world is something that we constantly create and recreate, limited only by our imagination, our intelligence, and our virtue. Human affairs can never be reduced to the merely technical, as the so-called social sciences lead us to suppose. They're always and everywhere matters of judgment, subject to revision and interpretation. In human affairs, the realm of political economy, justice, social cohesion, we need not more technical scientific expertise. What we need is more wisdom. So the best hope for a human solution to our differences, I suggest, is one where the public square is plural but does not pretend to be neutral. And this will be where the substantive moral values of the private sphere can enter into dialogue with one another as such, rather than pretending to be something else. Muslims can speak as Muslims, Hindus as Hindus, Christians as Christians, atheists as atheists. And by the way, on the uh, UK census, there is an increasing percentage of the population who self-identify as Jedi Knights. So I should probably add to my list, Jedi Knights can contribute as Jedi Knights. And clearly that's going to make for a messier public square than one tightly controlled by utilitarian ideology. But it will be much more likely to stop any one section of society or any one institution from doing too much harm to others. It also offers a much better prospect, I suggest, of bringing the state back under the control of its citizens to serve the common good rather than its own interests or the interests of the elites who control it. One thing on which I think we can all agree, whatever religious or irreligious stripe we may have, is that the state is not God. The state must be made to serve humanity and not the other way around. 
You may find this idea of a public plural discourse appealing. But there is a counter-argument to it presented by atheists and humanists who prefer the status quo. They argue that political equality requires respect toward others and that this principle is violated if religious reasons are advocated that are not acceptable to some citizens. As an example, I cite again the humanist philosopher Julian Beginini. I want to be clear that Beginini is in fact a careful and generous-spirited secular humanist, not at all given to the kind of rants against religion that we regularly hear from Richard Dawkins. And Beginini is one with whom I think I have more agreement than disagreement. So I cite him precisely because his argument is thoughtful and careful, but also because I think that in advocating neutral language in public is wrong. He argues, quote, that when we seek neutrality and demand that everyone talks a common neutral language of the civic sphere, what it requires is that articles of faith or other substantive conceptions of the good life do not carry any weight simply because they're matters of faith. The requirement is to justify your position in terms that are not exclusive to your specific comprehensive worldview. In another essay, Beghini gives an example of what he means, which is very revealing. Listen to this extract from his essay, The Rise, Fall, and Rise Again of Secularism. Quote, I was the co-author of a pamphlet, pamphlet written by a group of humanist philosophers making the case against religious schools. We did not disguise our own non-religious views, which obviously influenced how we argued, but we did attempt to make our case in terms everyone could accept. Most obviously, we never used the alleged falsity of religion as a reason not to have religious schools. Rather, we argued on the basis of factors such as the autonomy of the child, and social cohesion in terms which included rather than excluded the religious. The principle behind this was classically secular. We need to make a case that the religious could agree with too. Well, Beghini seems to think that the only part of his argument about religious schools that constitutes a matter of faith that's exclusive to his comprehensive worldview and therefore that he should keep out of public reasoning is his belief that religion is false. So he keeps that out. But he fails to see that his belief in, for example, the autonomy of the child is also a matter of faith that is exclusive to his worldview, a belief with which people of many other worldviews would disagree. So I think that Beghini is entirely justified in making the argument he wants to make in the way that he makes it. But he's wrong to imagine that he's not in fact doing exactly what he says he does not want people of religious faith to do. And I suggest that this is because all substantive moral values are exclusive to some religious worldviews over and against others. Humanism is just as much a religious worldview as Buddhism is, and indeed is acknowledged as such by most humanists. So this is the reality with which public discourse must reckon. Rather than trying to hide it through the imposition of an artificial and ultimately unrealizable neutral language. Well, what does constitute respectful public reasoning then? The Christian political philosopher Jonathan Chaplin makes two important points in this regard in his essay, Talking God. The first is that political equality applies to persons not to reasons. Reasons are precisely things that we must be free to express and free to dissent from. Reasons are clearly not equal. Some of them are better than others. We respect persons by respecting their right to speak in their own voice, not by making them express their views in a language that's not their own. The second point that Jonathan Chaplin makes is that the kind of secular reasoning that atheists like Beghini want amounts to an epistemological privileging of rationalism, which is why it's always exclusive of many other worldviews. 
But a public reason is not an epistemological category, it's a sociological phenomena. Public reasons are simply reasons that happen to have some rhetorical purchase in a given cultural context. So it may well be wise for Muslims or Christians, for instance, to explain their policy proposals with reference to arguments that others can relate to. But how they do that is a matter of effectiveness in debate, not a matter of giving equal respect. For instance, the idea that all human beings are created equal before God and should therefore be treated as such is clearly a religious argument. But in many societies, it's also an entirely intelligible public reason. So how should we speak to one another in public? I've argued for a pluralism in public reasoning that respects the political equality of others by listening carefully to their particular and substantive views. There's a real concern that the current functioning of secularism is creating increased tension and conflict in society. Many groups feel marginalized and excluded from public life. Some secular humanists are concerned that the kind of pluralism I'm advocating will be too difficult to manage, might, might make matters worse. It seems to me this assumes an immaturity in society. People of faith are not grown up enough to debate well, but more dangerously, a paternalism of the state. The state has to maintain order by suppressing genuine debate. Now, the context of this in many people's minds is that provided by the late American political scientist Samuel Huntington, famous for his analysis and theory of a clash of civilizations that will dominate 21st century global politics. Whatever we make of that theory, it seems to me that the best way to avoid a clash of civilizations is to ensure a dialogue of civilizations in our public life. I want to conclude briefly by considering our third question. Should Christians support secularism? I've argued for a shift in the way we understand acceptable public discourse, away from trying to impose an artificial and unrealizable neutral language on all speakers, toward a genuine pluralism that permits all speakers to make their public arguments in their own voice. Does this mean that I'm rejecting secularism? Well, I began this lecture by pointing out that secularism has at least some of its roots in Christian theology. I believe that Christianity does support a version of secularism which insists that state power, the power of religious institutions, be kept separate. This is partly in order to ensure that the state does not serve a particular sectarian interest, but maintains a public space where a plurality of expressions of belief can flourish. But it also reflects the Christian doctrine of sin, its awareness of our capacity to be corrupted by power. Because in general, Christianity prefers the widest possible distribution of power in a society. It's entirely aware that the church, consisting as it does of fallible human beings, is just as capable of being corrupted by power as any other institution. Moreover, the joining of spiritual and temporal power tends to distract and distort the church from its fundamental mission in the world, which is to witness to Jesus Christ and his invitation to be reconciled with God. Practically, I believe this means that Christians should support the separation of church power from state power in those societies where it is joined in a state church. In other words, Christians should support the disestablishment of state churches. Similarly, I think Christians should support, for example, the removal of public prayers from state functions. Prayer, after all, is a confessional and private matter. Jesus himself taught against using prayer as a public display of religiosity. 
there's nothing to prevent faith-based politicians from arranging their own prayer meeting before the business of the day if they wish to. But there's a difference between separating religious institutions from state institutions and removing religious discourse from public life. Because the public arena is not equivalent to the state. And it's important, crucial, for all of our freedom that those two not be equivalent. The public arena needs to be larger than the arena of the state. The public life of a society should, on this view, be full of a diverse pluralism of debate. Neither does this separation of religious and state institutions mean that religious people cannot run for public office. It means that all politicians, whatever their beliefs, must seek the common good of the whole society, because that's what the political realm is for. In doing this, they'll rightly be informed by their beliefs, whatever they happen to be. If in the process of being elected, they've been entirely open about those beliefs, how they impact their political views, we'll all be able to make better judgments about our political representatives. Christians then should support a pluralistic form of secularism. They shouldn't try to hold on or return to the privileges that Christianity enjoyed in the past in some societies, but rather should encourage a pluralism that allows all people to be themselves. Christians should support this because Christianity teaches them that God allows all of us the freedom to choose how we will live even when we choose to deny him. Well, I want to close by asking a final question. I've argued that Christians should support a pluralistic form of secularism, but should secularists support pluralism? I've already proposed that the best way to avoid a clash of civilizations is to ensure a dialogue of civilizations. But that, of course, is a negative argument that pluralism is necessary to avoid conflict. What positive reason might there be to embrace genuine pluralism? It seems to me that the world is facing enormous challenges. An economic crisis that's exposed the moral failings of capitalism. An environmental crisis that threatens the integrity of the planet's ecosystems. The growing threat of resource wars over food, oil and water, just to name a few. And so far, we've failed to solve these problems using all of the incredible technocratic means at our disposal. I suggest the reason is that each of them requires not just technical and scientific expertise, although that is surely crucial, but also moral vision and moral reform. And so the exclusion of substantive moral and ethical discourse from our public consideration of these matters actively hampers our ability to actually address them. The substantive moral imperatives of religious belief are an incredibly powerful force for positive change in the world, far more effective than legislation or regulation. So I commend pluralism to secularists because I think that the common good requires the inclusion of the widest possible range of contributions toward that end, including those of religious communities. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, Daniel asked me to um, make a comment, but actually I prepared to just ask a short question and leave the time for all of you here to have a dialogue with Paul and actually, as he said, he advocated dialogue. Um, actually, the, this, this Monday that um, we have organized an interfaith dialogue in which uh, we have um, religious leaders from uh, Judaism, uh, Islam, and Christianity and have a dialogue on the human rights. Um, I think the, the leaders as well as the participants in general, they could agree with the general principles of human rights as reflected uh, from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. 
But when when they go to the details, like for example, whether same-sex marriage should be uh, recognized by law, or whether laws are against uh, discrimination on sexual orientation uh, should be enacted. Now, the disagreement, we can see the disagreement in the dialogue. So my question is just that uh, I totally agree with the importance uh, of having that, uh, the kind of dialogue in the public square, but how could a consensus be built or developed or, or, or even established by, by this dialogue? As the uh, religious perspectives, or maybe the atheist perspectives, or the humanist perspectives, they may agree with some things in general, but very often when you go to the details, that the disagreement will appear. So how, how, how could the, the uh, consensus be built through the dialogue? Well, thank you. I mean, I, I guess my answer is in just about the same way that we try to build consensuses anyway in democratic processes. Um, uh, listen to any debate on the floor of uh, any Western parliament and you'll find that it's very hard to build consensus, even with the uh, rigidly controlled um, language um, that I've described as a problem. So uh, the fact that we can't all necessarily immediately agree, I do not see as a problem. Um, it's surely the very nature of democratic debate that we have a diversity of views and opinions and each of them has to be subject to um, a sort of rigorous examination, to a probing, uh, an, a questioning of the reasons, a questioning of the evidence uh, on which the, the, the arguments are being made. And that seems to me to be no different in principle to the way in which we already try to resolve um, differences in discussion and debate. The difference of outcome is what's more important. It's not that by having um, this more plural openness to religious dialogue that we're going to more easily reach consensus. Clearly, we won't. What's more important is that we will um, have a much wider sense of ownership in the democratic process. And it seems to me that one of the problems of democracy uh, in the late 20th and early 21st century is precisely the democratic deficit, the feeling that my views are simply not represented anymore in the democratic process. If they are represented and represented well, all of us are going to feel a lot better about the outcome, even if we don't necessarily completely get everything we want. Uh, so that would be, I think, my, my main response to you. But let me just add, if I may, one, one more observation. I was part of um, an interfaith dialogue, which included, of course, atheists and humanists, as well as many, many uh, uh, other religious groups. Um, on globalization itself, uh, in September, of this year, and uh, the, this was organized by uh, a think tank uh, that very much took the view that I've espoused, uh, more or less. So we had speaker after speaker getting up and talking about, first of all, the diagnosis of the problems of globalization, and then their prescription. We were focusing on global capitalism in this event. So we would hear from a Sikh the Sikh perspective. We'd hear from a Muslim, we'd hear from a Jew, and so forth. And what was interesting was that actually in this case, I can see that in the case you've given, there wasn't a lot of agreement on detail. But in this case, there was disagreement on the reasons why we wanted a particular policy to be advocated, but quite a lot of agreement on what the policy should be. So we could all end up owning um, uh, quite a lot of similarity we could all end up owning a particular approach, even though we had our own reasons for agreeing with it. But the, the process was one in which everybody came out feeling like they'd been heard and they were able to buy in to this process. So certainly, the kind of pluralism I've described is no panacea. It's not going to suddenly make everybody agree. But it is going to make everybody more engaged and hopefully um, uh, more aware of why different people argue the way they do. And isn't that an improvement on the situation we have now? Thank you. Okay. 
Hello, Professor Williams. Uh, my name is Yanis. I'm a third year medical student here at the University of Hong Kong. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Um, the main argument I hear from your talk is that um, uh, the, what Christianity brings is harmony in a pluralistic society in seeking a common good, what you uh, referred repeatedly to as shalom. But um, I had a little bit of difficulty in, in, in agreeing with that because uh, when you look back in many religious institutions when they express their opinion, um, for example, we hear that the Church of England just earlier this week has banned um, female bishops. And when we look at the Catholic Church, their doctrine in banning condom use and their involvement in the UN Cairo Population Conference years ago in subjugating the sexual freedom of women. Or even look no further in Hong Kong, the Society of Truth and Light in a recent, um, in a recent consultation for legislation against anti-discrimination laws of uh, people of different sexual orientations. To me, it seems that um, there is a fundamental difference between people who claim that their arguments rise from their faith and those who do not. Um, because priests, for example, the Catholic Church has um, this doctrine that when priests preach, they preach in persona Christi, which means that they are preaching in the person of Christ. And when they preach these doctrines, they preach it as eternal truths. So imagine telling uh, a 11 or 12 year old child that um, nulla sal uh, nulla, uh, extra ecclesiam nulla salus, which means outside the church there is no salvation. Imagine telling that to a, ch to a child that if they don't believe, they will be burned, they will suffer an eternal hellfire. I think that is something that I would not want to see. It definitely does not contribute to what I think um, would, would contribute to what is known or referred to as the common good. I mean, for other forms of non-religious belief, for example, for eugenics, for example, for narcissism, if somebody dares to advocate that in the public sphere, we will fe feel very enraged. We will immediately sanction such expression of opinion. So uh, my question really is this. Do you think that there is necessary to impose a limit on the expression of um, ideas based on religion, and if so, how it could be enforced. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for um, the way you frame that question, which I think is very helpful. Is there, um, I mean, the first, the first thing to say is that, um, you, you know, you've picked on some very controversial examples there. Um, but the first thing to say is one of the inevitable um, f features of the pluralism I'm, I'm advocating is that um, we have different ideas of what the common good is. And I think that that, I mean, uh, this, this, we already know this. I mean, you've already mentioned several ways in which your idea of the common good is in conflict with some of the ideas of the common good that seem to be uh, advocated in different religious institutions. So I think one thing I'd want to say uh, because I don't want to get into sort of defending individual um, particular positions. I'm not even sure I could defend them. Um, but is that I think the first instinct in a truly plural society is not immediately to say, well, you're saying something that seems um, shocking to me. Therefore, you're not seeking the common good. I suggest that the first instinct needs to be explain to me how you think that serves the common good. Um, so that would be one remark I'd make. Uh, your, your question, though, is a good one because certainly people are going to be making comments that other people in society violently disagree with. Um, the, the idea of um, the, um, the sort of moral autonomy of, of, of the individual, for example, is also a position that many people would disagree with quite strongly. And obviously, that's an example of uh, a position that conflicts with the idea of, let's say, the religious education of a child. If you believe that a child is already a completely autonomous moral agent, you're going to be very offended at any kind of education that doesn't reinforce that moral autonomy. On the other hand, if you think that children as a matter of nature, are not morally autonomous, um, then you're going to find it abusive to try to teach them that. So that's a place where we're going to have to dialogue about what we mean and why we're taking the kinds of positions we're taking. Where should the limits be? Um, probably there are others who could define these limits more carefully than I could, but it seems to me that the limits are going to be uh, around things that are truly inciting of... Uh, hatred, uh, of uh, violence, 
uh, toward others. So advocating a particular um, policy about education is not doing that. But um, violent threats or sort of demonizing of groups because of their views surely is. So it seems to me those are the sorts of places that we're going to want to place limits uh, on, on public speech is incitement to, um, to violence uh, and uh, sort of active discrimination. But I think exactly how we define that is another sort of thorny issue that we probably want to go into very carefully. Okay. Yep. Hi, thank you. I'm Chen Ling. I'm from the law faculty. So just to pick up on your point about how the dialogue should be about the common good. So I'm just imagining there's this Muslim person talking, uh, advocating for a law to ban, to ensure that all women dress modestly. And of course, the, the Christian will ask, no, how, explain to me how this serves the common good. And this Muslim person will say, well, because Allah says so, as it's in the Quran, the Christian guy say, mm, I don't find that particular convincing. And the Muslim guy say, it's okay. I mean, I have 70% of the population, so the law will pass. And this is really my question, because I definitely support your view about public, uh, the use of religious reason, the free expression in the public sphere, because it's inevitable. And of course, more speech obviously help us make a better informed decision. But I guess the question Benny asked, and again, I guess it's also asked by the previous questioner, is really what happens when the words are put into actions, when the words becomes law, and in a similar fashion. Mm. And you try to deflect it, and, and I really admire your very balanced and nuanced approaches. You talk about a form of self-imposition that, like Christians advocating faith, must respect pluralistic, must respect pluralism. But I'm just wondering, are you imposing a view, a restriction on laws, on expression, that any expression of religious faith must take into account pluralistic view? What if they are common good, their vision of common good, exclude pluralism? What if they feel that these are sins which cannot be tolerated and which must be stopped? The sins could be same-sex marriage, but it could be simply believing in a different God. Thank you. Gosh, there's quite a few uh, questions embedded in that. Um, so I'm not sure how I, well I'm going to do justice to, to what you said, but I think that... Um, uh, I'm gonna, c can I ask you just to repeat the um, sort of, you had, I think, two main questions. Would you mind just repeating them for me? I suppose the question is actually one, that in a democratic society where reason often led to vote, the problem is that the public discourse could be quite scary, simply saying that this reason, the reason why I want to impose this law because my religion says so, and it is resolved, the consensus so-called is reached by democratic process where it's not about general consensus but sometimes essentially it's about 50% of the vote of the population agreeing to it. Mm -hmm. And the resulting is a law which is in a sense oppressive or even harmful to the, to the other half. And yes. in this sense, the fact that they can voice, oh no, but the Bible says that's wrong, I don't think gives them much consolation when they face with the law, when they find that they have to cover up because the other 51% of the population think they should. And they voice it explicitly because it is because the Quran say they should. Yes. Well, I think that, see, let's take the example you, you give of, um, uh, you know, the, the, the Muslim headscarf. Let's take that, okay? So that's an actual example in France. It seems to me that the argument about the common good is not do I agree with the um, reasons of Islam for headscarves to be worn? It, it doesn't really matter whether I agree that Allah says so is important. The relevant question is rather, is society served best as a whole? Because these are people. They're first of all human beings, not Muslims, right? They're first of all human beings. So is society served by allowing them to do what they believe and wear a headscarf? That's the common good question, it seems to me. Um, so it's not necessary that we have to get into an endless series of arguments over whether we agree with the particular 
reasons that a religious community has for wanting to do something. Uh, that would be the first point I'd make. I think that the, the second point is that you talk about law, and of course we're moving into another realm when we talk about law. We've got public discourse about public policy, and then we've finally got the state making a decision. And it seems to me that what's very important when we draft legislation is that the language that's used has the broadest possible appeal to the entire society that it affects. So it will be very important that the framing of the law, the wording of the law, does not include, um, let's say, religious-based arguments, even though they might have been quite um, influential in the debate, they don't get written down if they're going to end up marginalizing some groups as a result. You want, you want the law to be drafted as broadly as possible. Now, you can't actually define what that's going to look like because it's going to be a function of the tone, the ethos, the culture of a society at a given time. Um, it, it's not in any way... Uh, let's say, discriminatory, that many of the laws of Great Britain are framed within the language of the Christian religion. It was natural for that to be the case because that was the religion of the vast majority of the population. Would, would, would it be appropriate to uh, draft legislation in the same way today? Well, no, it wouldn't. So you see, it moves. What's appropriate in terms of the drafting of legislation moves with the tone uh, of, of, of opinion within a culture. And I don't think that we can really come to a, a, a solution better than that. Because to do so would be to say, we've got to first of all figure out what the language is that for all time is the right language to use. But that would be to prejudge the truth of the various moral claims being made. Which is precisely what can't be done uh, in a plural society. Any other questions? Yeah. I'm not too sure when you mean um, kind of hard to get a neutral language for dialogue in public discourse uh, because people should just say from like uh, whatever identity you are. Because I think um, for me, the prerequisite for dialogue is the willingness for both sides to try to understand the other perspective. Then there will be dialogue. Then there will be, I would say, uh, advancement. Um, if, if I just think of, um, actually, I, I, I don't like to speak English. I just want to keep speaking Chinese. I would never have a dialogue with you. Mm. And uh, if I try to speak very Christian language to a friend of mine, uh, it's very hard for him to listen to me because he probably shut off once he hear. So, we are always trying to speak very secularly in the marketplace, especially. Of course, we have Christian value and all that. So I'm not sure about kind of keeping our identity and language because I think the heart to really reach out and try to speak a language the other side understand is actually humility. Is actually probably the first step for uh, this call. So um, just kind of want maybe I, I kind of misunderstand you. Maybe you can clarify a little bit on that. Yeah. I think you make an extremely important point, uh, which I fully agree with you, which is that um, a, a dialogue necessarily requires charity in the use of language. Um, in fact, it's an aspect of love to understand and use the language of the other as far as possible. I wish for example, that I could have given this lecture in Cantonese. Uh, <laughs> um, because that would have been a more charitable way for me as a visitor to speak uh, to you. But sadly, I, I, I can't. My facility in Cantonese is uh, non-existent, in fact. Um, <laughs> but I think that, so the point is not that I'm suggesting that it would be a good thing for all of our uh, public debate to be full of Christians talking Christian jargon and Muslims talking Muslim jargon and so forth. I think what I'm getting at is that to say things that matter, all of us need to start to talk about the moral values that truly inform what we fundamentally believe about the world. And that will require 
um, breaking through the idea that public language can only be in in the can only be neutrally rational and scientific. The, the, the language of morality is fundamentally excluded. And when we start to talk about the moral values that uh, animate us, we are likely to find ways of doing that that are particular to our particular um, religious tradition or worldview. So it's entirely appropriate that, for example, humanists will talk about the moral autonomy of the individual and explain what they mean. That's their jargon. Um, but they'll, if, if they're doing that charitably, and many of them do, um, then they'll, they'll do their best to communicate that in a way that um, people of other worldviews can understand, because they're trying to communicate some, a moral value that they consider to be important. But when, um, uh, let's say, uh, a Muslim wants to make an argument, they're not going to use the language of moral autonomy. Now, if they keep quoting the Quran at everyone, it's not going to be very um, instructive or persuasive. But that doesn't mean they can't explain the, the, the fundamental moral instinct that they have and why they think it's important. But that, that's the problem that I'm seeking to overcome, and that's the way in which faith groups in particular find themselves alienated because the minute they start to use substantive moral reasons, they face this accusation that they're breaking the rules of secular discourse. So they can't be themselves and they can't, uh, and by virtue of that, so many substantive moral values are in practice excluded when they're desperately needed. It doesn't take too much uh, insight to see how badly we need to talk about, for example, what are the moral values that we want to inhabit the market economy, business, globalization? These are the questions that all citizens want to talk about, but the language of technocratic economics, for example, uh, to insult the discipline that I've studied, um, keeps that out. And that's the problem we've got to overcome. Okay, I think we have to end the dialogue this evening, but we hope that, uh, because of the time, <laughs> we are, but, but surely we will have more opportunities of uh, this kind of dialogue in the future. So, Danny, want to I make just want to, to thank Paul, not only for giving us a very thoughtful uh, talk, but also for modeling a form of shalom, of opening a space where we can begin to talk about these things in a, in a very fruitful and, I think, a very peaceful and wholesome way. So, thank you very much, Paul. I hope you found this um, session meaningful, and if you enjoyed it and found it uh, meaningful, I hope you do get in touch with us on our website, and also you can be a friend by, um, uh, on Facebook with us as well. We have more tomorrow at a conference, and so I hope to see some of you there. Thank you very much for coming, and hope to see you again. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.